I wanted to uh, just welcome everybody and thank you all for coming. Uh, I think you're in for an enjoyable night. Uh, I had the privilege of listening to Dr. Stanley a couple years back in England, and uh, he's thoroughly entertaining and uh, extremely knowledgeable. So uh, you didn't come to hear me, so I'll let you take it away. <laughs> okay. Uh, I wouldn't clap until I've done something, to be honest. It might be rubbish. Um, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, well, it's a great honour to be here, and, and, and I really genuinely am thankful that on a cold Friday night, none of you could find anything better to do uh, than come and watch me. Um, so I'm very heartened that there are so many of you. The fact that I am talking to half of my audience aren't actually uh, watching me here now. They're upstairs in the cheap seats. Um, the good thing is they can't he if they heckle me, I won't be able to hear a thing that they say. Um, okay. By way of introduction, my laser pointer doesn't show up on plasma screens, and the people upstairs are watching a feed of this. They can't see a laser pointer, so I'm not going to be able to point at anything. Um, so that's going to uh, be a bit more fun. Anyway, by way of introduction, my name is Neil Stanley. As you can see, I am a PhD, so I'm not a medic. I'm a proper doctor. I've been involved in sleep research for the last 32 years. So all I've ever done as an adult is watch other people fall asleep, probably not what I expected to do when I left school, but it's what I've ended up doing. Um, I've worked uh, initially at the Institute of Aviation Medicine in Farnborough in Hampshire in the UK, working alongside the Royal Air Force, looking at things like aircrew workload, jet lag, shift work. I was the first person ever to record sleep in the cockpit of an aircraft whilst it is in flight. And yes, if you are flying transatlantic, they are asleep all the time. Uh, don't worry, it's perfectly safe. So they tell me. Um, <laughs> uh, and I still hold the record for recording more people higher up a mountain for longer than anybody else has ever done so. In the early 90s, I moved to the University of Surrey, where I created and ran the world's largest clinical trial sleep laboratory. It was a 24-bed unit. And as part of that, I designed and constructed the 12 finest bedrooms built anywhere on the planet for a good night's sleep. Totally dark, totally quiet, temperature-controlled, Single bed, teddy bear. That's all you need for a good night's sleep. But for the last five years, I've been the world's only peripatetic sleep expert. This is actually the way I spend my life. I travel the world talking about sleep to anybody who will listen, uh, mainly healthcare professionals, doctors and nurses, but I do try as much as possible to uh, talk to the general public. I'm a member of all the societies you're meant to be a member of, and I've published 37 uh, peer-reviewed publications with basic sleep researchers, uh, sociologists, psychologists, you name it, I've published in sleep. Um, so I am genuinely a sleep expert. Now, you might think, well, he is a sleep expert. What's he doing in a furniture showroom. Surely there's more exciting things he can be doing. And the honest answer is, no, they're not, because I think that uh, there is a huge disconnect. You can go to the local bookshop, and I'm sure there'll be numerous books about sleep. You may have purchased one of the books about sleep. You may even have read one of the books about sleep. You almost certainly, if you have done that, aren't doing any of the things it's told you to do. So I'm going to try and change the world one person at a time. So if just one of you goes away from here having got the idea that you should be getting a better night's sleep and with the tips and techniques I've given you, try and get a good night's sleep, then I have succeeded. If all of you do it, then I will be absolutely delighted. Now, there is a declaration of interest here. Vispring, the British manufacturer of handmade beds, and for you, those of you who are downstairs, the beds are in this sleep area here, um, have paid for my travel and accommodation. This is the fifth night uh, that I'm doing in North America. I've done Canada this week. I'm doing the USA next week. Um, I get a monthly retainer from Vispring to do lectures like this and to write web content for them and to train UK and US sales staff. However, Vicebring have no editorial control at all over what I say or what I write. And you are not once tonight going to hear the phrase, please buy a Vicebring bed. 
Now, Jeff and his team here would be delighted if every single one of you bought a Vispring bed. Maybe not tonight, maybe tomorrow you want to come back and buy a bed. And I'm sure they'd be very happy and they've given you cheese and wine so you deserve to, sp to return the favour and buy a bed from them. Um, but I'm not trying to sell you a bed, I'm trying to sell you sleep. Now, if you get the idea about sleep, you may just get the idea about why you need a good bed. And I implore you, you've all come out tonight, you're all interested in sleep. But please, please, do what I tell you during the lecture and go and lie on the bed. Yeah, feel what luxury can feel like. Yeah, so just, we're going to be around at the end. I'll be around at the end to answer any questions and also be around in that area. But please try the beds out. You've come all this way. You haven't got to rush home for anything. Yeah, lay on the bed. I'll lay down next to you if it will help. Because <laughs> um, I'm jet lagged. I could do with a sleep. But, you know, do what... Anyway, so, and I have talked for other bed companies, so I'm not just a, you know, I'm not a one-man band. Anyway, so, drink wine. Mm-hmm. Mm. Nice wine. Okay. So, one of the joys of, of coming to North America is the fact that you get jet lag. And one of the joys of that is that you get to stay awake all night watching that thing that you call television and I call complete rubbish um, of infomercials. Now, this slide needs to be read in the style of an infomercial. You know, that strident voice promising that if you buy now, um, it will be guaranteed in 60 days. Anyway, so anyway, how much would you pay for an all-natural product that can make you happier, healthier, more intelligent, protect you against heart disease, Stroke, depression, diabetes, obesity. Helps you lose weight. Makes you more attractive to the opposite sex. <laughs> improves your love life. And actually adds years to your life. Now, if I had a product, a bottle, a potion, that could do three of those things, I would have no trouble selling them to you tonight for a fortune. And I would be a very rich and very happy man. If I had something that did all of those things, I'd be the richest man on earth. But there is something that does do all of these things. Unfortunately, it's sleep. And I don't own sleep. So I'm going to be poor for the rest of my life. But unlike all these lotions and potions and all these exercise routines and diets and all these things that are going to promise you eternal life or whatever they're promising you, sleep has got the science. Every single one of those statements is backed up by science. It's scientifically proven. And yes, you do appear more attractive to the opposite sex if you have had a good night's sleep. There's actual studies from the University of Edinburgh that show this. So why don't you do it? Why are you on a diet? Why do you go jogging? Have you ever seen a jogger smile? <laughs> They're the most miserable people on the planet, aren't they? In their silly clothes. Um, and yet you know how good you feel after a good night's sleep. So why don't you do it? So what is sleep? Well, this is Thomas Decker writing back in 1609. For sleep is that golden chain that ties health and our bodies together. Sleep is by far the most important thing you can do for good physical, mental, and emotional health. Much, much more important than diet or exercise. Sleep is vitally important. It is the very foundation for good health. Shakespeare in Macbeth talks about sleep that knits up the raveled care, sleeve of care, the death of each day's life saw labor's bath, balm of her minds, great nature's second course, chief nourisher in life's feast. 
That really sounds quite good, doesn't it? Yeah, that sounds like something you want to have. So we've always known that sleep is important. So why is sleep important? Well, sleep's important because if it wasn't important, we wouldn't do it. From an evolutionary point of view, sleep has remained pretty much constant. Essentially, if it has a brain, it sleeps. If it's a mammal, its sleep is exactly the same as ours. And when we get to our closest cousins, their sleep is almost indistinguishable from ours. It's a universal phenomenon, and it's a biological imperative. We haven't got better at it, quicker at it, more efficient at it over the years. Now, there is a reason for showing you an orangutan and a western lowland gorilla. And it's not just that they're cute. And when that slide went up, all the women in the audience went, ah. All the men went, ah. They just did it internally because they're men. Um, but what's important about these guys is these guys never sleep in the same place twice, which means each and every night they need to make a nest. What is important about that is the nest has to be comfortable. If the nest is not comfortable, they either get up and modify the nest or actually make an entirely new nest. Which means in terms of their sleep comfort, they're vastly more intelligent than the majority of you are. Because most of you, I'm sure, spent less on your bed than you did on your TV. Certainly much less than you spent on your car. Some of you may have gone to Ikea and bought something that resembles a bed but isn't really. <laughs> um, or, some, or you may have gone to somebody who will flog you a mattress out the back of a van. For, I mean, I, I as was driving around to do some radio this afternoon, uh, we went past this uh, shop, uh, Queen Pillow Top, um, uh, divan sets on sale, $298. Bargain. Yeah? How rubbish is that going to be? So, you probably haven't... Okay, we'll do that, because we've got a nice big audience. How many of you spent $10,000 on your bed? And the people upstairs don't put your hands up, because I can't see you. How many of you spent $10,000 on your bed? $5,000 on your bed? Well done at the back there, good girl. Some people here. $2,000 on your bed. Yeah, $2,000. How much did you spend on your TV? No, oh, there we are. Okay, made, made my point. So, what are the functions of sleep? Well, sleep remains a biological enigma. We know why we sleep. We don't know why, or the way we sleep. We don't know why we do that. Sleep's non-negotiable. It's the biological imperative. It is the second most important voluntary, voluntary thing you do. You will die of lack of sleep just after you die from total lack of water and six times quicker than you die from total lack of food. That is how important sleep is to the body. We know it's needed for recuperation and restoration of both physical and mental functioning. It's important for the function of the endocrine, metabolic and immune system. So basic health is affected by lack of sleep. Sleep affects all organs of the body. But actually, it is only the brain that needs sleep. All those things that you know about sleep, that you've been told about sleep, can actually happen 24 hours a day. But only during sleep does the brain's activity reduce to any degree. So the brain must have sleep. So what is sleep? Well, as a normal human being, in any one 24-hour period, you're in one of three distinct states of being. You're either awake, or you're in non-rapid eye movement sleep, or you're in rapid eye movement sleep. Now, REM and non-REM are as different from each other as they are from awake, so they are st separate states. Non-REM sleep is the majority of the night, 75 to 80% of the night, and is traditionally made up of four stages of sleep, each of increasing depth. Now, I say traditionally. A few years ago, the Americans, who control sleep as they control everything else, decided that counting up to four 
was slightly difficult for them. And so they combined stages three and four together. So now they actually only have to count up to three. Um, but anyway, so stage one is the transition from awake to asleep. So if you are awake and you're going to go to sleep, whenever you go to sleep, you will go through stage one sleep. It's, of course, the lightest stage of sleep, such that if I were to wake you up during stage one sleep, you would say, why did you do that? I wasn't asleep. Now, this leads to what we know as sleep state misperception and what you know as your partner saying, I had an absolutely terrible night last night. I didn't sleep a wink. It was awful. And you say, well, that's funny because you were snoring all the way through it. Stage two, 45 to 50% of the night, the biggest individual chunk of the night. Stage two sleep is a bit of a mystery. We don't know why we have it. We know it's important because we have lots of it and animals have a state that's akin to it, but we don't know what it does in humans. We know it as true sleep simply on the basis that if I were to wake you up during it, you would say, why did you do that? I was asleep. As you can see, much of my 32-year career in sleep Research has been involved waking people up for no apparent reason. Stages three and four, deep slow wave sleep, 25% of the night. Slow wave sleep is the most important part of sleep. Slow wave sleep is the bit of sleep that makes you think like you've had a good night's sleep. It's the restful, recuperative part of sleep. And slow wave sleep is vital for four reasons. Memory, forgetting, learning, and growth. So everything about today that you experience, you will sort out tonight during deep sleep. In a bit in the same way as you sort out your emails. You get loads of emails. Some of those emails you can just delete immediately. You don't need to read them. Some you read and then you delete, and others you read and they're important, so you put them into one of your folders. That is what your brain is doing with all the facts, the factual information that you've received today. Some of it you keep because it's important, and a lot of it you forget because it is unimportant. Which means that if you're trying to pass an exam, there's no point staying awake all night cramming. Because if you cram, all you do is you gain a lot of information, but you don't file it away. So you don't know where it is. So when you sit down at the exam in the morning, oh, it's on the tip, oh, oh um, it's, um, it's on the tip of your tongue. You don't know where you've put it. So if you want to pass an exam, read what you need to remember three times, get a good wind down, get a good night's sleep, and you'll be able to find and retrieve the information. Of course, that's not a guarantee that you'll pass in the exam. You may just be stupid, but it, it, it will help you as, as much as you can. You learn during the night. So if you practice a task until you're as good at that task as you can be before you go to bed, and that can be a verbal task or a mechanical task, actually get a good night's sleep. You'll be up to 17% better or quicker at that task merely because you have slept. And slow wave sleep is the only time you physically grow during the entire 24-hour period. So I, of course, had loads of slow wave sleep when I was a child. Now, rapid eye movement sleep is the second state of being during the night. Rapid eye movement sleep is when you have your long narrative dreams. Everybody dreams... Everybody dreams four or five times a night, but you can only remember your dreams if you wake up during them. So if you don't wake up, your dream is gone, and it's gone forever. Now, when you're dreaming, your dreams are real. They're as real to your mind and body as you sitting here now is real. And you know sometimes you wake up and you think, I can't possibly go to work today. I'm completely exhausted having spent the last eight hours fighting dinosaurs. It's true. Your brain genuinely feels that you have done that. 
Now, it would be a bit embarrassing then if four or five times a night you'd have run around the bedroom being chased by dinosaurs. So nature protects both you and your bed partner from harm. So when you dream, you lose all muscle tone. Essentially, you become floppy. Except, interestingly, one bit of the male that does the exact opposite. <laughs> However, that has nothing at all to do with the content of the dream. It is simple, <laughs> fluid dynamics. Your dreams are involved in emotional well-being and emotional memory. So you need deep sleep for factual memories, REM sleep for emotional memories. So it's important you have both. So how is sleep put together? Well, this is a typical night for a typical adult. Essentially, within 15 to 20 minutes of you switching the light off, you should be asleep. All things being equal, a healthy adult will fall asleep within 20 minutes. You all know that taking more than 30 minutes to fall asleep is indicative of insomnia. You'll quickly go through stage one sleep, through stage two sleep, into your first consolidated period of deep sleep. So 20 minutes after you've fallen asleep, you will be in deep sleep. After 70 to 120 minutes, you'll have your first REM period. That actually only may, la may last five minutes long or so. A bit more deep sleep, and then on a 90-minute cycle, you have your REM periods. Your REM periods are getting longer during the night. Your last REM period of the night maybe 45 minutes long or so. Now, you as a healthy adult are preferentially designed to wake up during REM. So if you woke up this morning without an alarm clock, you almost certainly woke up during REM. Hence, that's the dream that you will remember. The fact that you remember that dream doesn't mean that's the dream you tell your partner about. Because let's be honest, the vast majority of your dreams are incredibly boring. And your partner has already grown to suspect that during the day you're really quite dull. So why, during your fantasy life during the night, can't you be bothered to show some initiative? Um, anyway, and of course, if that dream were actually remotely exciting, you still wouldn't tell them about it because they never appeared in it. So how does sleep change with age? Well, children need a lot of sleep. Why do children need a lot of sleep? Because they need a lot of deep sleep. Why do they need a lot of deep sleep? Memory, learning, growth. Every important thing about the development of a child occurs during the night. You muck up the night, you muck up the child. Just 30 minutes less sleep than a child needs has a measurable effect on that child. So a newborn needs 16 to 20 hours, a 10-year-old needs about 10 hours sleep a night. So what are the consequences of poor sleep for children? You take a child on a Monday morning, give it an IQ test, deprive it of half an hour of its habitual sleep need for the next four nights, redo the IQ test on the Friday morning, the child will have lost five IQ points. Now you may remember that a few years ago we banned leaded petrol because leaded petrol affected the IQ of children. Over a year, leaded petrol reduced the IQ of a child by three IQ points. And that was thought significant enough to ban leaded petrol. Half an hour less sleep than it needs for four nights reduces it by five IQ points. Now, of course, if it goes back to sleep, it gains those back. But it does technically, before we became politically correct, IQ is based around a median of 100. You lose 5, that takes you down to 95. There's a technical descriptor of somebody with an IQ of 95. That word is stupid. So if you want your child to technically be stupid, deprive it of sleep. Six-year-olds who get less 
than 10 hours sleep compared to six-year-olds who get more than 11 and a half hours sleep have twice the rate of being overweight and three times the rate of being obese. That has nothing to do with diet or exercise and everything to do with poor sleep. There's a difference between the majority of children with a diagnosis of attention deficit disorder and a sleepy child. Answer, precisely nothing. When you were at school, you didn't have ADHD kid in your class, did you? You had odd child, stinky child and child not picked for the football team, but you didn't have ADHD child. Now, is that because there was a lack of educational psychologist spotting these children? Or is it the fact that you went to bed at 7 o'clock, you read for 20 minutes, your light was turned off, and you never, ever got out of bed after your light was turned off? Many of you may have seen Super Nanny, yeah, Joe Frost. You've seen what she does to those, little, those lovely children. And it's got nothing to do with giving them an amphetamine derivative and everything to do with putting them to sleep. Exactly what your mum did with you and your gran did to your mum. And you, by the looks of you, well, some of you, turned out pretty much okay. Bit of a drop in preteens, then you get teenagers. Teenagers are different and teenagers are odd. Teenagers are different because they need more sleep than adults. The reason for this, they're going through puberty. Physical, emotional changes they need to deal with, they deal with during the night. That's why they need more sleep. But teenagers are odd because teenagers genuinely need to go to bed later. There is a shift in their biological rhythm. We don't know why, but it is definitely there. So teenagers really do need to go to bed later. However, that shift is only maximally two hours. So a teenager should be going to bed at 11, 11.30 and sleeping for nine to nine and a half hours. That means a teenager who says they cannot get out of bed at nine o'clock in the morning might be telling you the truth. A teenager who says they cannot get out of bed until 3 o'clock in the afternoon is merely lazy. <laughs> Go through your teenage years into your early 20s, your sleep need becomes fixed for life. Old people do not need less sleep. An 80-year-old needs exactly the same amount of sleep they did when they were 20. What changes is their ability to get that sleep. Because what happens as you get older is you progressively lose your slow-wave sleep. So sleep becomes less refreshing. So when the elderly person says, I'm not sleeping well, they don't actually mean I want more sleep. They mean I want better sleep. I want to sleep the way I did when I was 20. Remember when you were 20? Your head hit the pillow, you died for nine hours, you woke up and you felt absolutely wonderful. Well, that's what the elderly person wants. That's what they remember. Sleep used to do this for me. Why doesn't it do this for me now? That's what I want. So they feel less refreshed from the sleep. Now, the other thing about losing your slow wave sleep, if you think back to children, children have all of that deep slow wave sleep. Children can sleep anywhere, through anything, and if they wake up, they can go straight back to sleep. There's a huge pressure on a child's sleep. It's the most important thing they do. So if you don't have that slow-wave sleep, you're going to be more easily woken up, and when you are awake, you're going to find it more difficult to go back to sleep because there's no pressure for you to sleep. And of course, as you get older, there are more things to wake you up, and more things to keep you awake. But you need to be aware that the thing that wakes you up is not necessarily the thing that keeps you awake. If you think about it, middle of the night, you wake up, 
you need to pee. You get up, you go to the bathroom, you get back into bed. Men can do that in less than a minute and a half. Women take a little bit longer because they wash their hands. <laughs> that anecdote cost £7 million. I was asked to do a study, uh, 20,000 patients across 17 countries in Europe looking at drug X versus drug Y. We found nothing with the drugs, but we did find out that women washed their hands. Um, you can imagine how excited the drug company were when we told them that we'd wasted their money, but we did find that. Anyway, so, anyway, so you've, you're back in bed, so why can't you fall asleep? It's not the bladder anymore, you've just emptied the bladder, so what's keeping you awake? So you need to look at what might be keeping you awake. Snoring husband, cats on the bed, uncomfortable bed, anxiety, depression, pain, whatever. Now, there is a sex difference in this loss of slow-wave sleep. Men start losing their slow-wave sleep a lot earlier than women. Men start losing their slow-wave sleep from around the age of 35 or so, which is why, guys, your memory is going. Women start losing their slow-wave sleep from around the age of 55 or so, which is, of course, why your wife can remember every bad thing you have ever, <laughs> ever done. Now, the reason for this difference in loss of slow-wave sleep is very, very simple. Men are very, very simple. Other than the blindingly obvious men actually only have two evolutionary roles. That is to hunt and to protect. Now we're good at it. We're big, we're strong, we have a lot of stamina, and we have forward-facing eyes, so we're able to lock on to our prey and hunt it down. Now, of course, a man's forward-facing eyes are his downfall. Because it means when a man wishes to look at a pretty lady, he has to move his head. Women have 40 degrees more peripheral vision, which means when a woman wishes to check out a bloke, she doesn't have to move her head. Women have been shown by using eye-tracking software to look at men a lot more often the men look at women, because they can do it guilt-free. <laughs> because every time you do it, men, you get caught, and you get to be made to feel like some sort of filthy pervert. They're doing it all the time. <laughs> anyway, so you've got your man hunting, protecting, then they get to around 35 or so, and you know what it's like, women, yeah? Oh, my knee hurts. B bit of a bad back. Maybe I'll hunt and protect tomorrow. I'll watch the football today. That'd be better. So, from an evolutionary point of view, a man over the age of 35 is what's known as no bloody use for anything. <laughs> and should actually just crawl to the back of the cave and die. Um, and you see this in, in you know, alpha societies, lions, gorillas, chimpanzees, when the alpha male becomes weakened, he's deposed, he's pushed out by a younger, more virile model. And you know, he goes off and leads a bachelor life and dies miserable. Um, and so women, your biological imperative is telling you that when your man gets to around 35 or 40, to get rid of him. He is useless. And you can shack up with a younger, more virile male who is able more to protect and hunt for you. That's what your body, your evolution is telling you. Women, however, need to preserve their slow wave sleep because women can have babies and women need therefore to be adaptable to learn new things because they need to be around to look after the babies now the upshot of this difference of course as i mentioned earlier men have worse memories than elderly women men of course statistically die younger than women 
It's not like the old joke, why do men die before their wives? Because they want to. Um, <laughs> and men also have worse sleep. Women complain more, just in general about everything really, but they complain more about poor sleep. But over the age of 60, men have worse sleep. Okay, we're just strong and silent about it. So I tell you your sleep need is fixed for life. How much sleep do you need? Well, sleep is like height. It's genetically determined. Some people are short. Some people are godlike and tall. <laughs> Some people are short sleepers. Genghis Khan, Adolf Hitler. Napoleon Bonaparte, Margaret Thatcher. Some people are long sleepers, me and Einstein. <coughs> Anywhere between 3 and 11 hours can be considered normal. However, <coughs> getting the right amount of sleep for you is important. One hour less sleep than you need is a problem. So, of course, most of us are between seven and nine hours. I'm actually a nine and a half hour a night person. But if you're a three hour a night person, you only need to get three hours a night. So trying to get eight hours is going to be a complete waste of time. You don't need it and you can't get it. And actually, the eight hours is the biggest myth in sleep. I collect sleep books. I've got the finest collection of Victorian sleep books in private hands. And I cannot find the recommendation that we should all have eight hours. It, 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 it somehow cropped up, I believe, around the 1960s or so, but it's not based on any truth. And, of course, if you're an 11-hour-a-night person, just getting eight hours sleep a night means you're going to have a major sleep deprivation. So it's about getting the sleep that you need. So how do you know how much sleep you need? It's very simple. One question. That question is, how do you feel during the day? Because if you have a problem with your sleep, you are going to have daytime consequences. So if you feel happy, alive, awake during the day, you don't have a problem with your sleep. If you feel tired during the day, you probably don't have a problem with your sleep because tired has got nothing to do with sleep. Tired has got to do with what I like to call having a bit of a rubbish life. Tired has got to do with it's Friday, it's winter, it's bloody freezing, it's probably still snowing or started snowing or God knows what it's going to do. Um, I'm in Edmonton. I haven't won the lottery, so I'm going to have to carry on lecturing to people like you for the rest of my life. I'm far away from home. Oh. On Monday, I've got to fly to Los Angeles where it's plus 25. I mean, how rubbish can life get? Um, anyway, so, you know, it's, so it's got nothing to do with sleep. Being sleepy has got to do with sleep. <coughs> Almost fell over there. <laughs> Need to drink more wine, losing my balance. <laughs> so I thought if I get you laughing, I don't have to talk, so I can drink. <laughs> mm. You might say, what's the difference between being tired and being sleepy? It's very simple. You walk up three flights of stairs. When you get to the top, do you need to sit down or do you need to sleep? If you need to sit down, you're tired, fatigued, knackered, exhausted. If you need to sleep, you are sleepy. Sleepy people have a problem with their sleep. Now, all those people in the downstairs, because again, I can't see anybody upstairs to put their hands up. How sleepy are you at this moment in time? One, if I were to shut up for a second, you'd instantly fall asleep. And ten, you are the most awake you have ever been. Who's a ten? No, you are not. Because if this is as good as it gets, 
you really need to do something about your life. Anyway, nines, eights, sevens, sixes, fives, fours, anybody below. We'll call an ambulance for those people. (laughs) Now, if you are a six or below, I truly hope you're not going to get in your motor vehicle and drive away from here this evening. Because your performance in driving that motor vehicle will be as impaired as if you are over the drink driving limit. If you are a four, your performance driving a motor vehicle will be as impaired as if you had had four pints of strong beer. Now, I know that's not possible in Canada, but um, (laughs) you wouldn't turn up to work drunk So why have you turned up to work today equally impaired through lack of sleep? The impairment's the same. Your performance is the same. But being drunk and driving is bad. Being sleepy and driving is perfectly acceptable. Going to work drunk is a sackable offence. Going to work sleepy is a day-in, day-out occurrence. Why? The, the, The consequences are the same. So if you are sleepy and you fall asleep at the wheel of your car at 60 miles an hour, it will take your car four seconds to come off the road. Try it tonight. (laughs) Set your car up, 60 miles an hour, straight and level, take your hands off the wheel, count slowly to four. It gets very, very exciting around three. Now I have to say, that is a joke. I only have to say that because I was lecturing to some psychiatrists recently and a guy at the back put his hand up and said, that's very irresponsible that you'd recommend we do that. (laughs) Anyway, your reaction times are slower, attention becomes unstable, vigilance is poor, problem-solving, judgment deteriorate. Sense of humour goes. You know the sleepy people? They're the miserable ones, aren't they? Yeah. Uh, pain threshold is reduced. The more sleep you are, the more you feel pain. Now, remember I mentioned the fat kids earlier. I know it's not politically correct to call them fat kids, so we'll use the right term for them, fat children. Um, (laughs) We live in a society that is obsessed with diet and exercise because we have a problem with obesity and diabetes. And we believe that diet and exercise is related to the increase in obesity that we've seen over the years. What is interesting is nobody's shown you a graph to show a correlation between them. Because actually there is no graph in existence that shows that it's been our diet and our exercise that's led to obesity. Because it's not. What is leading to obesity is the fact that we are sleep deprived. The more sleepy you are, the more you crave sugary and fatty foods. 33% 33% increased desire for sugary and fatty foods, 24% increase in overall appetite. It's the very primitive reward centre of the brain which is activated when you're sleep deprived. So you really do want to eat sugar. I don't know if you've seen this stuff in the press that sugar's the new nicotine. No, it's not. Sugar is lovely. Sugar tastes nice. The reason we have to eat sugar is not because it's addicted, because we are sleep deprived and we are craving sugar. If we were to get a good night's sleep, we wouldn't need to eat as much sugar. It's as simple as that. If you take normal college students, deprive them of just half of their sleep for two nights, watch what they eat on the third day, they'll eat up to 1,000 calories more simply because they are sleepy. If you take sleepy people and give them money and send them to the shops, they buy more junk food. They are craving the sugar. They're craving the fat. Which means if you are trying to lose weight or maintain a healthy weight, there's no point going on a calorie-controlled diet. They don't work. Within 12 months, 95% of women have put on every single pound they lost on the diet. Which is why there's a new diet every two years. You're all doing the 5-2 now, aren't you? I promise you, 
In 18 months' time, you'll be doing the 4-3, the ADF, the Alternative Day Fasting. They've already started talking about launching the book for that. Two years ago, I can't remember what you were doing. Four years ago, you were doing the Atkins. Six years ago, you were eating a lot of cabbage, probably, for no apparent reason. Because you want to be young and healthy. Well, don't go on a diet. It's a waste of your time. It's not going to work for you. Get a good night's sleep. And sleep loss has also been related to increased risk of cancer and that sort of thing. So here is the increase in body mass index in the US over the last 100 years correlated with the reduction in sleep time. Here's a graph showing that if you have a woman, you sleep for the right amount of time for you, you won't put on weight. Sleep less than you need, year on year you'll put on weight. Sleep more than you need, year on year you'll actually lose weight. Sleeping more than you need also massively increases your risk of uh, cardiovascular problems and hypertension and diabetes. So you'll die young, but at least you'll die thin. And here are the fat kids that I mentioned earlier. Double the rate of being overweight, three times the rate of being obese. So if you want to cure obesity in your kids, put them to sleep. Simple as that. If they sleep, they won't want to eat that rubbish they call food these days. They'll also behave better, so you don't have to hit them as often. Um, so it's a win-win situation all around. So here's a graph showing the correlation between short sleep duration and obesity in children. Anything between 1 and 10 is showing that there is a positive correlation, and there's the same in adults. Sleepiness, as I mentioned, causes traffic accidents. Sleepiness causes more deaths on the road than drunk driving. Yet I doubt if you've ever seen a sign on Canadian Highway saying don't drive sleepy. No? There's some. How about compared to how many don't drink and drives? Yeah? So, you know, it's, you do drive sleepy, you don't drive impaired. The worst time for accidents are between 2 to 7 o'clock in the morning. Nobody should be driving a car between 2 and 7 o'clock in the morning. And nobody should be driving a car between about 2 and 4 o'clock in the afternoon when you have your post-lunch dip. So poor sleep kills. Increases morbidity, mortality, risk of falls, traffic, occupation accidents. Increases your risk of cardiovascular disease. Immune response goes down. Poor sleep increases the risk of Alzheimer's by three times. Increases your risk of depression ten times. In terms of healthcare costs, cost society more than smoking and HIV AIDS combined. Leads to suicidal behaviour, triples it in teenagers, doubles it in adults, and increases the risk of obesity and diabetes. So there's not anything good about poor sleep. So here's again a graph showing that there's a correlation. It's not a massive correlation, but a correlation between short sleep duration and all-cause mortality. So... I've told you the scary monster thing. You're now going to run away going, I must get a good night's sleep. I must get a good night's sleep. I shall go and buy a book or I'll go and buy something off the internet or listen to some expert about how to get a good, good night's sleep. Well, let's say, I collect Victorian sleep books and I've got over 700 sleep books of various sorts. So I know all the sleep advice that anybody's ever given anybody about how to get a good night's sleep. And this is it in five sentences. You will not find anything in the books that basically deviates from these five sentences. They may dress them up. They may write chapters on each of these points. But this is it. Sleep-promoting environment. Well, we'll talk about this a bit later. But dark, cool, quiet, fresh air. Comfortable. That's all you need. So we'll come to that in a bit later. Strong association between sleep and bed. If you are asleep, you should be in bed. If you are not asleep, you should not be in bed. The bed is where you sleep. Which means the bedroom, the room with the bed in, is the place you sleep. Your bedroom is not your office, your games room, your cinema, or your sex dungeon, it is the sleep room. Therefore, everything about the bedroom should be about sleep. 
So this strong association between sleep and bed. So if you've been in bed for 30 minutes at the start of the night and you haven't fallen asleep, get up, do something else, go back to bed when you're sleepy. If you've been awake for 20 minutes in the middle of the night and you still can't go back to sleep, get up, do something else, go back to bed when you're sleepy. doesn't really matter what you do. Have a cup of tea, watch some TV. It's not going to stimulate you. You're awake. <laughs> For women, I recommend doing the ironing <laughs> because what better motivator to go back to sleep than a big pile of ironing? And if you don't go back to sleep, well, you've done the ironing. Um, Go back to bed. If you still don't fall to back to sleep, get up, do something else, go back to bed when you're sleepy. Don't lie in bed going, I must get to sleep, I must get to sleep, I must get to sleep, I must get to sleep. You're never going to fall asleep if you do that. Now, this is the key one. Quiet mind, relaxed body. Now, of course you need a relaxed body to go to bed, but a relaxed body is never enough for sleep. You know you can be absolutely physically exhausted get into bed, and you can't fall asleep. Why? Because your mind is racing. So you have to remember, I told you, the brain's the only bit of the body that needs sleep. You have to quieten the mind. Now, I cannot tell you how to quieten your mind. I know what works for me. I read every night, however late I get to bed, however sleepy I am, however knackered I am, I read. That works for me. Will it work for you? No idea. And I'm not going to tell you it will. So you need to find your own way to go to sleep, to wind down, to relax. And it's very simple. Does chamomile tea help you sleep? Does it relax you? Yes. Well, then it helps you sleep. Does yoga help you fall asleep? Does it relax you? Yes, well, then it helps you fall asleep. Does listening to Led Zeppelin really loudly help you go to sleep? Does it relax you? Yes, then it helps you fall You see the pattern here? It's not really complex. So you need to relax and wind down at the end of the day. Now, this is a surefire way that I guarantee will work for the women in the audience. You come home, you have a nice meal. Notice I didn't say you cooked a nice meal. That would be sexist. You maybe got a takeaway. I don't know. But you have a nice meal. You spend a couple of hours with the kids. Then you send them to bed because they need to go to sleep. You then spend a couple of hours with your partner. Any more than that, and you're going to start arguing, so don't be optimistic. So around 9 o'clock or so, you go upstairs. You run yourself a nice warm bath. Some bubbles, your favourite oils, candles, music playing softly in the background, a small glass of wine. You luxuriate in that bath, letting all the stresses and strains of the day soak away from you. You then get out of that bath and you put on a big, fluffy, toweling robe. And you get into a bed that's been freshly made. That would work, wouldn't it? Yeah? Every single one of you, that would work, wouldn't it? So why the bloody hell don't you do it? (laughs) How much would it cost? Nothing. I'm not asking you to jog or run a marathon. I'm asking you to be nice to yourself. How good advice is that? I don't even need you to pay me any money to tell you that. It's free. Oh, I'm busy. Busy doing what? Oh, Facebook. I have to tell everybody I'm having a bath. (laughs) There's a male version of this. My bloody ear thing he's pulling. There we are. Hello, world. Listen to me there. Um, You come home from work. You have a nice meal. 
the wife's gone and got a takeaway, so it's all right. Um, no washing up. Um, it's time with kids, time with partner. Nine o'clock, she goes up for a bath. Woohoo! You can enjoy yourself. Um, <laughs> she's gone for half hour. So there you are. You sat in your big leather button back armchair, a fire burning in the grate. Your faithful hound asleep at your feet. You're wearing your finest velvet smoking jacket. A fine single malt in a lead crystal glass. And a big Havana cigar. Okay, our version costs more than the female version. But come on, guys, you're worth it. You're going to die five years younger than they are. You've got to get your enjoyment when you can. So whatever quietens your mind will help you sleep. Whatever it may be. No direct effort towards sleep, yeah? The harder you try to fall asleep, the less likely you are to fall asleep, yeah? Lying in bed going, I must get to sleep. Or having that expectation. You know what it's like on a Sunday when you go to bed early to wake up for Monday and you don't fall asleep? <laughs> you know, oh, my God, I must get to sleep. It's Monday. And then absence of regular thought processes about sleep. Don't worry about trying to get a good night's sleep, Yeah? Go to bed when you're sleepy, and if you wake up, you wake up. If you have a bad night one night, you can probably have a good night the next night. So don't worry about it. Don't stress about it. The more you stress about or the more expectation you put for getting a good night's sleep, the less likely you are to get a good night's sleep. So really, don't think about sleep. Just do it, as a certain company would tell you uh, in their advertising. You don't need to think you just need to do. A friend of mine said, you can't find sleep. You have to let sleep find you. You have to put yourself in the position where sleep can find you. And that's it. That's all you really need to know about how to get a good night's sleep. So we're now going to talk about the bedroom. There are only two things you need to buy the highest quality, a pair of shoes, or for women, many pairs of shoes, and a bed. Because if you're not in one, you're in the other. The bed must be a beautiful place, not only because you make love there, but because you dream there as well. You can tell she's French, she's talking about sex. So, the bedroom needs to be a sanctuary. I said, it's the room you go to sleep in. So, no computers, no TVs. It should be pleasant and relaxing. It should be dark. How dark should your bedroom be? Well, the red standby light on your TV is enough light to disturb your sleep. So, when I say dark, I mean dark. It should be quiet. The World Health Organization says it should be 35 decibels with intermittent peaks of 45 decibels. You might say, how quiet is 35 dB? That background is about 28, 29 dB. So not much more than that music, which some of you are probably going, what music? He can hear music. He must be drunk. <laughs> Crazy man. Um, so really quiet. And of course, the next one is that it should be uh, not stuffy. Fresh air is good for sleep. Um, of course, it's now minus 20 God knows what overnight. Um, but you should have the window open tonight, so at least you can have some fresh air, because if you, of course, have the air con, it's going to make it really, really noisy. Um, it should be neither too hot nor too cold. We'll come on to that in the next slide. And of course, perhaps most importantly, you need a good and comfy bed. So during the night, you have to lose half a degree of body temperature in order to get a good night's sleep. You lose that temperature out of your head because it's the big fleshy bit that sticks out from under your duvet. That means the bedroom needs to be cool. There needs to be a temperature gradient for you to be able to shift that heat. doesn't really matter how warm it is in the bed. To be honest, you're just one big cuddly hot water bottle and you'll actually heat up the bed to the correct temperature anyway. So unless it's absolutely freezing cold, you don't need to do anything to the bed because you'll heat that space up. But you do need the room to be cool. It's recommended 16 to 18 degrees. For a man, really hot. For a woman, bloody freezing. Um, so you need a cool bedroom. Now, it may surprise you to know that uh, in America, they do not have toilets. 
Um, you know this because every American sitcom is based in the kitchen diner. They may have a lounge, which is where they go for the important talks with the family. They may just have a bedroom, but they never have a toilet. You know why? But anyway, but what is interesting is in America, only 8% of your time is spent in the kitchen, whereas 58% of your time is spent in your bedroom. Compare and contrast how much you spent fitting out your kitchen and how much you spent fitting out your bedroom. Grossly, grossly different. People will spend a thousand dollars on a tap that dispenses water in exactly the same way as a three dollar tap would do so. But having an expensive tap makes you look sophisticated or stupid as it is known in English. Um, because, of course, when you show somebody around your house, you say, look at the lounge. You've got this whacking great telly. You've got your Italian designer furniture. You take them into the kitchen. You've got all your appliances matching and all that sort of thing. The bathroom is d wonderful with your tiles and your wet room and all that sort of thing. And then you get to the bedroom. And you open the door and go, that's the bedroom. And they can see a bed in there, so they know you're not lying to them. Um, <laughs> And then you shut the door, and that's it. The bedroom's over and done with. You don't go and say, look, whip back the sheets and say, look, vice spring bed. I am a man of taste and sophistication. You may sleep with me if you wish. <laughs> so what about the bed? We're in a bed showroom. We're in a furniture showroom. There's loads of lovely beds behind the people downstairs. Some of you upstairs can see a bed if you look hard enough. Beds are for the body. Word of warning here, if you put sleeping women into Google, make sure your filters are set high. <laughs> There's some weird people out there. Anyway, so beds are for the body. Not for the eyes. Now, all of these are very, very beautiful. All of these are very, very stylish, and all of these are faintly ridiculous. So working from top left hand as you look at the screen. If you look at that bed, the mattress on it is only about two inches thick. Next one on the top row, really lovely uh, solution there, except for when the 18 stone guy on the top bed turns over during the night and flops on top of you. <laughs> Below that, the bed with no legs. I'm sure if I sat on that, it would break. And then lastly, the bed on that base. Now, my question is, how do you get off that bed? I think what you do is you roll off the mattress onto the shelf and then onto the floor and then like a baby giraffe stagger to your feet. Probably not the best start to the day. Now, during the night, you naturally move 20, uh, 40 to 60 times a night. Now, one of the reasons you move during the night is to relieve pressure. You can't sit in these chairs for eight hours without, you can't sit in these chairs for 20 minutes without shifting the weight on your buttocks and that sort of thing because you have to move your pressure. That's why you toss and turn in your bed. But one of the other reasons why you toss and turn in the bed is to find the cooler part of the bed. Some of you may know this. How many of you, when you get up to go to the bathroom at night, come back and flip the pillow over? Yeah, because it's cooler. Well, that's what your body is naturally doing in the bed. You're moving to find the cooler side of the bed. <coughs> so the position you fall asleep in and the position you wake in is not the position you stay in during the night. So when you get onto a bed you, to test it, you need to make sure you can turn over. If it takes a lot of effort for you to turn over, the bed's too hard. If <coughs> you feel uncomfortable, sorry, it, it's too soft because you've sunk into it. If it's uncomfortable on your shoulder, on your hip, you, it's too firm. Now, I had somebody last night in Calgary come <coughs> up to me and say um, that he's aware he only ever wakes up when he turns onto his side. Why is that? And I said, okay, it's a long shot. You've got pain in your shoulder, haven't you? He said, yeah. 
I said, well, when you turn on your side, you cause yourself pain, you wake up. And therefore, you remember, when you turn on your back, there's no pain, so you don't ever wake up. Um, anyway, what is a comfortable bed? Well, science cannot tell you what a comfortable bed is. Science is not amenable for describing comfort. Comfort is all about the way you feel, which means you have to get on a bed. Price, number of springs, what the bed's made of will not tell you how comfortable the bed is. You can't look at a bed and go, ooh, that's comfortable. You have to get on it for at least 10 minutes and then toss and turn in all those different positions. Now, some beds are made of natural fibres. Other beds are made of unnatural fibres. What's the difference? Well, the difference is every single piece of clothing that I am wearing at this moment is where made of natural fibres. Why? Because they perform well. Standing up here with these lights on me, I'm sweating like a pig, which is lucky that I have a cotton shirt on because that's allowing me to shift the sweat away so I'm not going to smell. If I had polyester, I would be reeking quite nicely now. Um, so, will you know the best thing is cotton or silk or wool or the natural... No, no goose down. Nobody's made anything better than goose down to keep you warm. So why would you spend your third of your night in artificial fibres? It just sounds a bit disgusting to me. How not to test a bed? Well, these pictures are from Life magazine back in 1948. But is this any better? Most people, when they try a bed, look like they've been laid out for their funeral. And the woman in the top left-hand corner, I am absolutely certain she's dead. <laughs> Bottom right-hand corner, the salesman's just staring at the woman's boobs. Bottom left-hand corner, they're just chatting each other. But top right-hand corner, there's your bed salesman. Ooh, look at my springs. The man is so excited by the presentation that his hat <laughs> is being strategically placed. <laughs> One thing to remember, whilst the bed is for the body, the pillow is for the head. The pillow is the bit that fills the gap between your head and the mattress, so it is important. So if you come to test the bed, don't go somewhere where there are no pillows because it looks bloody uncomfortable. Go to somewhere where they actually put pillows on the bed because that's how you sleep. You don't sleep without a pillow, so how can you test the bed if it doesn't have a pillow on? Now, I'm a sleep expert, and it may surprise you to know that some bed companies lie. Yes? Um, it may seem as a shock and to be honest because this is a public lecture I cannot tell you half of the things I know about the lying sods uh, because I'd get sued and I don't have a lot and if they took it away from me I would be a bit anyway. But they are, some bed companies are just shameless in the lies that they tell you. These are the only ones I can do publicly without getting sued. Pressure relief is important in a bed. Yes, of course it is. If you are confined to a bed, if you are dead or dying and you can't move out of your bed, you need pressure relief because <coughs> you don't naturally toss and turn. So if you're in a hospital or in a hospice, of course you need a foam bed too, so you don't get bed sores. But the strange thing is none of you are confined to your bed because you're sat here so not one of you needs a pressure-relieving bed because you can relieve the bed, the pressure naturally because you can toss and turn. Tossing and turning is the most natural thing in the world to do. Having a bed that stops you tossing and turning is like if I strapped you to this chair and said, oh, you don't move, that's good. You'd hate me after 20 minutes. So why would you get a bed that's stopping you doing the most natural thing during the night? Natural. Wool, horsehair, cotton, they're all natural. So are radiation, bubonic plague and granite. That does not mean that just because something is natural that it's necessarily good 
for beds. Latex is really, really good because it's very strong and very stretchy and you can make it very thin. So latex is fabulous for surgical gloves and condoms. <laughs> if you've got a bad back, the last thing you need to do is sleep on a hard bed. Nobody, unless they're a fat git like I am, needs a hard bed. If you've got a bad back, sleeping on a hard bed will make your sleep worse and your back pain worse. Actually, you need a softer bed if you've got a bad back. And anybody trying to sell you an orthopedic bed is a criminal because orthopedic is a medical word and beds are not a medical device. Reduces pain. No bed can reduce pain. I'm one of the world's leading experts on pain and sleep. It's actually what I spend most of my life lecturing about. Good sleep will improve pain, not any bed. Bed bugs. Any of you scared of bed bugs? Yeah. One of the saddest things about the decline of America is in the past America was scared of communists with nuclear weapons. They're now scared of really, really small bugs that can give you a slightly nasty nip. It's quite sad, really. But the one thing about bed bugs, they don't live in the bed. Bed bugs live everywhere but the mattress. They live in the crack between your headboard and the uh, base. They live in your clock radio. They live in your carpet. They live behind your wallpaper and behind the picture on your bedroom wall. And these little things can climb miles to live or to feed on your living flesh. Well, it's not really miles, it's feet, but they're very small, so it probably seems like miles to them. So no bed, regardless of what it's made out of, is bed bug proof. And buying a sheet to put over your mattress to stop bed bugs is a bit like bu building a border between America and Canada to stop the Mexicans getting in. <laughs> it's in the wrong place. So buying a bed, bed, bed bug protecting sheet is not going to make the slightest difference to how many bed bugs. The other thing to say is exactly there is no epidemic of bed bugs. If you look at any of the articles published about bed bugs, the experts they quote all own extermination companies. If you want to know about bed bugs, and this is the gospel truth, the world's leading researcher on bed bugs is at the University of Kentucky. Put Bed bugs, University of Kentucky, and you'll find every scientific thing you ever need to know about bed bugs. There's no great epidemic of them, so don't worry about them. Sheep, does the bed actually contain a meaningful amount of wool, or has the marketing team just seen a picture of a sheep? Zoned beds. I've spent my life looking for six feet tall women. Advertising agencies seem to have no problem. Look at these. These beds are all standard length. These means all these women must be six foot long. Minimum. Look at the woman on the left hand top. Look how her feet are flexed. In order for her feet to be in the foot and ankle zone, she's basically doing a ballet point. That must bloody hurt. So if you are my height, you would fit in those zones. If you're four foot one, you're not going to be anywhere near those zones. You're going to be all over the place. So how's that going to help? It's just silly. There's no such thing as a side sleeper or a back sleeper. You have 12 to 20 major positional changes during the night. So if you've bought a pillow that's for a side sleeper, you're just a victim of advertising or that you think you're a back sleeper. It's just not true. Adjustable beds. If you are dying, sick, or bedridden, you may need an adjustable bed. If you are not, you don't. If for cardiovascular problems you need to raise your feet five degrees in the air, stick a couple of planks of 4B tube at the end of your bed. 
cost about $10 from the local lumber yard and be just as effective. Because one of the things is about adjustable beds, they make really rubbish chairs. None of these people look comfortable. If you look at the family in the bottom middle photograph, what the hell are they doing <laughs> with their kids on the bed? What Don't these people, can't they f afford a lounge? Don't you want to just take a collection so you can buy themselves a lounge and a settee that they can watch the TV on? The woman in the red frame on the bottom left-hand side, she does not look comfortable. She looks all squished up. So if you want to buy a chair, luckily, people will sell you a chair. <laughs> if you want to buy a bed, buy a bed. Don't confuse the two. Memory foam. Now, some of you may know that memory foam was invented by NASA. And you therefore think memory foam must be really, really good because NASA is really, really good. Uh, any of you remember Chuck Yeager, the guy who broke the sound barrier? And they always said to Chuck Yeager, why did you never become an astronaut? You know, you broke the sound barrier. Didn't you want to go into space? And he said, no. Simple reason. Every time you saw a rocket launch, they'd all go crazy and clap like the sense of relief that nobody had died and blown up. And Chuck Yeager said, no, I, if I get in something that's going to go really fast. I don't want people to be relieved when it works. The expectation is it should work. Anyway, so NASA has not been exactly the most credible organization, right? but it was invented for aircraft seat cushions, for survivability in air crashes. It was never used for mattresses. And even if it was used for mattresses, one fact, Astronauts are weightless. Therefore, they don't need pressure relief because they have no weight. And that's how astronauts sleep. It doesn't matter if the back of it's made of memory foam. It's not going to make any difference. Medically proven... I'm sure you've seen adverts for beds where you've got a doctor with his white lab coat on, his name written on his breast pocket. I think it's because they're so stupid they forget who they are. Who? <laughs> I'm Dr. Smith. Um, now, I can tell you that if you see a doctor saying something in their white lab coat, they've been paid to say it, and they've been paid an awful lot of money. You may in future see me in adverts with a white lab coat on. If you do, I will be on my private yacht in the Bahamas um, because I have a price. It's quite high, but if you want to offer me something to endorse your rubbish bed, feel free. I'll take the money and prostitute myself. I don't care. Uh, but until that time, as long as I'm wearing this jacket, nobody's paid me enough money. This is the only jacket I own. Um, so, <coughs> dust mites. Now, dust mites are a problem because dust mites do live in the mattress, but they live in foam mattresses. Foam mattresses have four times more dust mite feces in than a, uh, than a, than a uh, spring mattress. The reason for that is because dust mites like warm, wet places. And there is nothing warmer or wetter than the air channel of a uh, foam mattress. So if you've got a kid with allergies, replacing a foam mattress with a, f with a sprung mattress will cut down their exposure to dust mite allergens. Although women say otherwise, size really does matter. You need to have a bed that is big enough for both of you to be able to move during the night. So in order for you to have the same amount of space in your bed if you sleep with another person as your child, you need to have at the very minimum a king-size bed. Any less than that, if you have a queen-size bed, you have... 15 centimetres less sleep space than your child has. Your child shares their bed with a glow-in-the-dark Teletubby. You share your bed with a kicking, punching, farting, snoring duvet hugger and wonder why you can't sleep anymore. 
Now, it's a cultural norm in our society to sleep with another person in a bed, another adult in the bed. And so that means that when you buy a bed, you need to be able to have a bed that matches both of you. And that's a bit difficult in a one-size mattress with the same tension. Because, of course, you never married your identical twin. Even in Edmonton, that's frowned upon. Um, <laughs> so um, you, you need to take into account their size, their weight, their medical conditions. So it's difficult to buy a bed. However, separate bedrooms are a good thing. Sharing a bed with another adult is not natural. From an evolutionary point of view, humans are the only animals that choose to share a bed for intimacy. Other animals share a bed for warmth or, or, or protection, but humans choose to share a bed for intimacy. But from a historical point of view, it's only poor people who have ever shared a bed because they never had the space. The rich do not share beds. We know Queen Elizabeth II does not share a bed with the Duke of Edinburgh because when Michael Ryan broke into Buckingham Palace about 30 years ago, he sat at the end of the Queen's bed. Prince Philip was in residence, but he wasn't in the bedroom. If you go to any stately home or castle in the UK, you will see the king's bedroom, the queen's bedroom, the lord's bedroom, the lady's bedroom. The rich have never slept together. The Romans invented the idea of the marital bed. The marital bed is where you consummated the marriage. After that, you never shared a bed with your wife. It is unnatural to do so. So rather than parking a big flash motor car outside your house to show how rich you are, just say, I don't sleep with my wife. <laughs> and those people in the know will know that you are both intelligent and wealthy. Now, I published this study in, uh, in 2005. Up to 50% of your sleep disturbance is caused by your bed partner. The most effective way of improving your sleep is divorce. <laughs> so there should be no taboo about having separate beds or separate bedrooms. Because isn't it better that you go to your own bed Okay, you've, nobody falls asleep in each other's arms, do they? That's just a Hollywood myth. After five minutes, you get pins and needles. And you know what it's like? Oh, I love you, I love you, I love you. Right, I'm going to sleep now. <laughs> Don't you dare touch me. So why not at that point go to your own bed, have a good night, and then in the morning, because you've had a good night's sleep, you feel a bit, Snugly, you tiptoe along the cord, you get into bed and you cuddle. Isn't that better than having that person who's just ruined your life for the last eight hours, snoring, farting, kicking, punching you, throwing your arm over you and go, how about it, dear? Because <laughs> compromise just means there are two miserable people. So why do people buy a bed? Well, it's cheap. It fits the room. It's the right colour, for heaven's sakes. It's stylish and maybe lastly, it's comfortable. And what puzzles me is why people don't get the point about buying a bed. Why do people find it so hard to spend money on a bed? You walk around the showroom tonight there are loads of lovely pieces of furniture, loads of lovely tables. I mean, from where I can see, there's a beautiful bookcase over there, which I'm sure has got a really high ticket on it. So I think it's ancient historic wood. I think they've knocked down a British stately home and built it out of it. Anyway, and I'm, it's absolutely beautiful. And you'd have no problem if you fell in love with it, spending a couple of thousand, four thousand, five thousand dollars on a, a bookcase. 
You go over to this side of the room, those people upstairs have got no idea what I'm talking about. You go over to this side of the room, and I say, spend $10,000 on a bed. You go, step away, crazy man. What do you think? $10,000 on a bed? What am I going to do? Well, you're going to spend a third of your life in it. What are you going to do with a bookcase? You're going to put books on it. Look at it for about five seconds a day and think, I actually don't like it, it's the wrong colour. Um, <laughs> now, you look at these cars. Hyundai Accent. These are US dollars. I have no idea what they cost in Canada. Hyundai Accent, very nice car, made by Koreans. Um, got four wheels and keep you dry. Then you've got the, high, the uh, Aston Martin 177, nearly 2 million US dollars. Handmade, hand beaten aluminium, built by British men in brown stock coats. Um, most beautiful car ever made. Um, but you can see, you know why there's a difference. That's been hand built, that hasn't. That's got style and class, that really hasn't. But if you're going to go to work, it doesn't matter which one of those you drive. Yeah, you're going to get there in the same amount of time if you obey the speed limit. But you understand that. So why don't people spend money on beds? Over a 10-year life of a bed, and a bed should last you, a good handmade bed should last you more than 10 years, a $1,000 bed will cost you 14 cents per person per night. Now, I don't know what you can buy in Canada for 14 cents, but I can't imagine it's an awful lot. I don't even expect you can buy much for 70 cents per day. Now, when I was in Halifax, uh, one of the girls who came to watch my talk had brought in a small cup of Starbucks. And I said to her, how much does that cost? She said, $2. And I said, how many of those do you drink a week? She said, well, I have two a day, every day. I said, so that's $4 a day on coffee. She said, yeah. I said, over 10 years, that would be $30,000 you spend on Starbucks. Oh, my God. But if I had said to her, spend $30,000 on a bed, she'd think I was crazy. And yet she's spending the same amount just on tepid, bitter coffee from Starbucks. So why do you find it so difficult? How much did you spend on your gym membership at the start of the year, which you've never used and never will use? How much do you spend taking multivitamins or this lotion or that lotion? You know that really expensive anti-wrinkle cream you use each day? <laughs> do you know there are only two, two ingredients that are possible in anti-wrinkle cream? Whatever stupid scientific names they're given, they're based around two ingredients, caffeine or ginger, both of which are irritants. You get a piece of fresh ginger, rub it on your face, your skin will swell up because it's irritated and you'll lose your wrinkles. <laughs> Absolute honest truth, that's the only two things that are in anti-wrinkle cream. So if you're buying the latest one from France in a funky um, glass bottle that's costing you $100 and it lasts a month, it's got nothing other than extract of ginger or extract of caffeine in it. But you happily spend that money because it makes you feel or look better. But you won't buy a bed even though it will make you look and feel better. As I said, beds are for the body. The technical specs tell you nothing. In conclusion, and you're thinking, thank God for that. <laughs> Nobody told me it was going to be an hour-long PowerPoint. If I'd known that, I'd have stayed at home and watched reruns of you beating us at curling. <laughs> or as it's known, marbles on ice. Um, so most of us were conceived in bed. We were born in bed. You're going to spend 25 years of your life in bed. You realize that if you live to 75, you're going to spend 226,000 hours in bed. You're going to spend 80,000 hours of your life working in employment. And hopefully, you're going to die peacefully in bed. <coughs> I want to die peacefully in sleep like my grandfather, not screaming like his passengers. <laughs> <coughs> Sleep is vitally important for good health and actually, of course, can be one of our greatest pleasures. Let's be honest. Waking up after a good night's sleep is a fabulous, fabulous feeling. 
I guarantee that if you take a multivitamin every night for the rest of your life, you will not feel any different ever. But I promise you that if you get a good night's sleep tonight, you will feel much, much better tomorrow. Simple as that. Instant payback. And of course, a good bed will play a role in ensuring good sleep. So it's worth investing time and effort into, and some money into buying the right bed. But what I find it strange is that people don't sell the health benefits. People buy a bed with the same amount of emotion that they buy a dining room table. A dining room table is not going to change your life. A new bed generally could do so. Sleep should be aspirational, like exercise and diet. If you le read those women's magazines where there's a lot more pictures than there are words, and these non-entities that are supposedly celebrities, you read about them and you'll find out about the brand of sneakers they wear, their personal train, what diet they're on, what gym they go to. You never find out about their sleep. Nobody ever says anything positive about sleep. Good sleep should be sexy. For a thousand years, since 898, we have used the phrase to sleep with to mean both to sleep with and to have sex with. So sleep and sex have always, for the last thousand years, been thought of together. So why is sleep not presented as a good, sexy thing rather than the thing you do when you've done everything else during the day? So I say, you spend good money on gym membership and diet and all that, so why don't you spend money on the benefits of good sleep? So, there is this revolutionary product. It doesn't cost you a lot. It's available to all of you. The instruction manual's quite easy, and it does work. It's called sleep. So I suggest you go out there and you get some. So... Good sleep, can it be life-changing? Yes, well, that's me saying thank you. That's who I am. That's my email address for hate mail. That's my website address if you want to know anything more about me, which isn't an awful lot. I do write something on the Vicebring uh, webpage on a monthly basis. And finally, not finally, I lie, there is one more slide. If you go home tonight and stick sleep tips into Google you'll find a whole list of sleep tips. Some people will give you 10 tips for a good night's sleep. Some, if they're adventurous, will give you 20. There are a couple who will give you 50 tips. Now, on a daily basis, I write a sleep tip on at Vicebring Tips on Twitter. Although it's a Vicebring branded thing, I have never once said buy a Vicebring bed. It's not a marketing exercise. This is a pure tip. This morning, I published my 359th sleep tip. It is bloody difficult to think up of new ones. <laughs> and I deserve to be more popular and to have more followers on Twitter than I have got. I know I'm not Justin Bieber, I'm not an ass, but I do want to be more popular. So if you do use Twitter, you sad people, then at least be sad enough to follow me, please. Um, if you don't, then fine. Anyway, this is a final thank you for me. Just before I flew out on Sunday, I desperately was writing a tips and techniques to fall asleep and a guide to buying a bed, which is basically this lecture in two fact sheets. And I was going to put them up on my website. But being an incompetent fool, I wrote the damn things and I didn't know how to put them up on my website. And I had to get a plane. So I'm pretending that this is my thank you to you. Because I know you've come out on a cold, dark night. And I know none of you have sat through an hour lecture for probably 50 years since you were at university. And I really do thank you for your perseverance. But if any of you do want a copy of my tips and techniques for a better night's sleep or my guide to buying a bed, 
They are currently unavailable anywhere else. That's not a boast, it's just my incompetence. Uh, but write to my Gmail address, Dr. Neil Stanley at Gmail, and I'll send them to you. They're free, without obligation. I'm not collecting your things for marketing. I haven't got anything to market. I'm not going to sell your details to anybody. The NSA know who you are and what you look on. So there's nothing I could sell to them anyway. But if you want a copy, please, please write to me. And the minute I get back home, um, in a week's time, I will send you free, no obligation. You can copy them, you can throw them in the bin, whatever. They're lovely PDFs, which I've written. If you've enjoyed my lecture tonight, if you've enjoyed the humor, enjoyed the entertainment, and you've thought it's any use to man or beast, then that will be re hopefully reflected in these. From the bottom of my heart, I genuinely thank so many of you coming out tonight to watch me. I've got to thank the guys from McAllen, to they fed me, uh, they've allowed me to eat their food, and they've allowed me to drink their wine, and they've given me a platform to be able to talk to you lovely, lovely people. And so I thank them genuinely for allowing me to come to the beautiful city of Edmonton. God, that sounds American, doesn't it? And um, go Canada, go. <laughs> I'll have to say USA, USA next time. Um, <laughs> Well, no, actually, I'm back here tomorrow. If any of you are daft enough, I'm back here tomorrow at 11 o'clock. Anyway, but thank you very much. There are beds over there. We'll be hanging around. The guys from the, the company will be here to guide you if you want. But I will take questions. If you don't want to ask your personal question in front of 100 people or 200 people, then come up to me afterwards. I will stay here until I physically drop dead from exhaustion um, answering your questions. You had your hand up long before I finished talking, so you can ask the first question. <laughs>